the quantum harmonic oscillator problem and its solution uh, go far beyond the uh, simple generalization of a particle and a spring problem in classical physics and uh, they appear in a variety of contexts in quantum physics as already mentioned for example uh, electromagnetic radiation can be thought of as a collection of harmonic oscillators the photons and much more generally uh, various complex structures in quantum mechanics oftentimes can be thought of uh, as being built of the small building blocks being a quantum harmonic oscillator but in each particular case the meaning of these uh, individual oscillators is different and today I'm going to show you the appearance of these uh, quantum harmonic oscillators in the context of a very interesting problem that uh, is sort of underlies uh, solid-state physics or condensed matter physics and this is a problem of excitations in uh, crystals which are collections of many many ions that form a periodic structure and these ions can oscillate and these oscillations quantum oscillations are called uh, phonons and we will see how these phonons appear and we will see also that they can be described in terms of the creation and annihilation operators that we introduced uh, in the first lecture this week to understand the concept of a collective mode, such as a phonon, for example, in a complex uh, quantum system, we uh, first can go back to classical physics and uh, uh, remind ourselves the uh, notion of a normal mode, which is equivalent to uh, the quantum collective mode. And these normal modes appear in complex classical systems. So here I have a primitive classical system. Uh, uh, if you want, this is a simple uh, harmonic oscillator and uh, in this case as we know the frequency of the oscillation is uh, is equal to the square root of the uh, stiffness of this spring divided by the mass uh, of this uh, of this object um, now um, if we make the system a little more complicated and instead of just one uh, oscillator consider uh, let's say two masses attached uh, to uh, let's say three springs in this case so uh, we have uh, a system here with, the, uh, with two degrees of freedom and this system will have uh, two different oscillation frequencies uh, corresponding to different types of oscillator motion. So for instance, this type of motion when the two masses sort of oscillate uh, in, uh, in phase with one another. So this, uh, let's say, first type of motion is described by the frequency which is exactly equal to omega. But uh, there is also a second type of motion that we can imagine in this uh, slightly more complicated system, in which case, let's say, these guys oscillate out of phase in this fashion, sort of. And this, oscillator, uh, this oscillation frequency, uh, let me call it omega 2 in this case, is equal to square root of times the uh, basic frequency of these guys. So let's assume they all have the same stiffness. And we can make things more and more complicated and uh, let's say in this case have uh, six, uh, six masses attached uh, to springs and in which case we will have six uh, different uh, degrees of freedom and six different oscillation frequencies. So, and these oscillation frequencies, normal, so-called normal modes in classical physics, they have an analog or in quantum physics. In particular, let's say in this example, in this example of uh, two uh, harmonic oscillators, uh, we uh, just by knowing the results of the classical um, uh, calculation, we can uh, write down, as a matter of fact, the spectrum of the quantum problem, of the corresponding quantum problem. So, uh, and uh, the spectrum of the corresponding quantum problem will be uh, simply uh, the energy is going to be equal to h uh, omega 1. Uh, and 1 plus 1 half h uh, plus h omega 2 and 2 plus 1 half and it's going to depend on two um, uh, uh, quantum numbers and n1 and n2 corresponding to two harmonic oscillators but these are not going to be directly the harmonic oscillators built out of let's say the coordinates and momenta of the two uh, of the two particles so uh, these uh, oscillators, or the corresponding creation and annihilation operators, are going to be a certain uh, non-trivial linear combination of these x1s, ep1s, x2, and p2, uh, which uh, sort of describe the generalization of these in-phase and out-of-phase motions to quantum physics. 
And in general, whenever we have a classical system with some normal moves, there is a corresponding quantum system with the, actually with the spectrum associated with these normal moves. A very interesting example of a complex many-particle quantum system is a crystal. We know that uh, crystalline structures of various types appear in a variety of uh, solid-state materials. And in these structures, so what happens is that uh, ions or atoms uh, of which this uh, solid-state material is sort of built, they arrange themselves into a unique uh, uh, order and pattern. And so if you, here, for instance, I'm showing a fragment of a so-called uh, simple cubic lattice. And these uh, blue balls uh, in this picture correspond uh, to atoms sitting uh, on their equilibrium position uh, on their lattice sides. But uh, this picture is a bit deceptive, actually it's probably better to say incorrect, in that uh, the atoms here in reality are not static. So they indeed uh, have some preferential positions and some equilibrium positions, but uh, they move around all the time, so this position that they occupy corresponds to a minimum uh, in some effective potential they feel, but they can oscillate near the minimum of this potential, and uh, these oscillations are basically described locally as uh, essentially harmonic oscillator motion. So a better uh, illustration of what a crystal is, so that I put together, well, for simplicity, uh, for a two-dimensional uh, case, so it's presented here. So instead of thinking about uh, atoms which are sort of tied together in this crystalline structure by some rigid uh, objects, we should think about atoms being tied together uh, by some elastic uh, springs with some uh, stiffness, which is finite. And so uh, when we look at this system, so uh, by analogy to what I had discussed, what I just discussed in the uh, previous slide, we can think about this system as a many oscillator system with a lot of degrees of freedom. So in reality, in, um, uh, in this material, so uh, there are not uh, two or three or six atoms like in the previous slide, but there are mil uh, billions and billions of atoms. And therefore, there are many uh, frequencies, eigenfrequencies, or so normal moves, that, uh, uh, classical normal moves, that appear uh, uh, and they correspond to various kinds of complicated oscillations uh, in this system. And um, in the limit of an infinite number, basically so-called thermodynamic limit, when we consider essentially an infinite uh, crystal, so these uh, discrete normal moves, they uh, merge into uh, continuum curves, which essentially correspond to elastic waves running through this uh, system. And um, Mathematically, these waves are described by a familiar expression. So if we think, uh, let's say, about the displacement of an atom um, uh, with regards to its equilibrium position, some delta r uh, as a function of time for a particular atom, let's say nth atom, so it's proportional to the familiar exponential of uh, k uh, dot r, so where this atom is located, minus uh, omega uh, t. But this omega is itself a function of k. And uh, so to find this uh, so-called dispersion, phonon dispersion, is the main question that appears in the context of this problem. And this is what is going to be of interest to us. Of particular interest is the question of what are the low energy modes uh, of this uh, system. So what it actually means is the following. Suppose uh, we have a completely static uh, uh, crystal. So, well, as static as it gets in quantum mechanics, there is always zero-point motion, but we can even consider a classical system. Let's say we just built, uh, physically built this model by attaching uh, a bunch of uh, masses to the springs and, and arranging them in uh, an equilibrium pattern. And let's say we touch uh, this uh, system a little bit, we apply very weak perturbation. So the question that I'm asking about the low energy modes is are we going to excite any oscillation in this uh, crystal or uh, this weak perturbation is not going to have any effect? Or in other words, do we have to overcome any threshold or gap as condensed matter people uh, call it in order to excite uh, the minimal uh, perturbation in the crystal? And uh, as we will see uh, later in, in today's lecture, so the answer will be that it doesn't matter how weak uh, the perturbation is, there is always a very low energy mode which corresponds to a long wavelength or small k uh, uh, wave running through the uh, sample, through this uh, crystal. 
Uh, and uh, this uh, type of an uh, excitation is called an acoustic mode or it corresponds uh, to sound, sound modes uh, running through, uh, through this crystal. And it turns out that uh, the appearance of these acoustic sound modes has a very profound explanation which goes as far as uh, relativistic quantum physics actually where there is a theorem called Goldstone theorem which guarantees the appearance of certain um, low energy modes. And um, even though I'm talking now about classical system, let me nevertheless try to connect it to uh, this uh, theorem. But I will present sort of a poor man's version of this Goldstone theorem, which is relevant to our problem. And then hopefully we will be able to understand how they are connected. So uh, this is going to be a little bit of detour. So the poor man's version of the Goldstone theorem that I'm uh, presenting is related to the notion of uh, symmetry uh, in uh, quantum physics that we already discussed. So suppose we have uh, a quantum system which is uh, invariant or symmetric with respect to a certain class of transformations. What uh, it means is that there exist transformations, let me call them U, uh, and uh, this operator commutes uh, with the uh, Hamiltonian which describes the system. So this is uh, what it means. Or in other words, uh, so U h uh, u minus 1 is equal to h itself. And let me consider the situation when there is uh, not just one or two symmetry operations that exist, but uh, as a matter of fact, we have a sort of, a whole family uh, of such operations, uh, let's say, labeled by some uh, parameter. Let me call it alpha. So an example of uh, such uh, a symmetry, for instance, could be a symmetry with respect to translations. So let's say if, we, if our Hamiltonian is symmetric with respect to translating everything, every single particle in space, let's say, uh, by a certain distance, so it could be a distance of one meter or one uh, centimeter or one uh, kilometer. So there is a whole uh, continuum of distances and directions in which we can translate our system, in which case this alpha actually is a three-dimensional vector of translations. And well, another example could be symmetry with respect to rotations, in which case alpha could represent uh, an angle that we can choose by which we can rotate our system. But in principle, it can be anything. So we just uh, basically postulate the, the existence of some symmetry, what is called symmetry group, but I'm not going to go into these uh, details, uh, uh, with respect to which uh, the Hamiltonian of the system is invariant. But uh, a very interesting fact is that even though uh, the uh, model itself can be invariant uh, under a certain symmetry operations, the quantum states, the, uh, for instance, lowest energy state or the ground state does not necessarily have to be invariant uh, under uh, the same uh, uh, symmetry uh, uh, U. So what it means is that uh, the system may find itself in a state, let's say, let me call it psi naught, such that, um, well, uh, U uh, acting on this psi naught is not equal to psi naught. So by translating, let's say, our system in space, we do not necessarily represent uh, the same state. And in this case, we call, uh, we, we say that the symmetry is broken or spontaneously broken. But the key statement, which is also the statement of this, of this Goldstone theorem in this context, is the following. If, uh, once again, we have a situation where the Hamiltonian is invariant under a certain continuum of uh, symmetries, but uh, some or all of these symmetries are broken in the state in which uh, the system finds itself, in this state, let's say, psi naught, then to each broken continuum symmetry, there corresponds a low energy mode, a sound-like mode, if you want, that we just discussed. Uh, and, uh, well, this statement, this correspondence is, uh, again, uh, the uh, statement of this Goldstone theory. So I realize that there have been, you know, a lot of words that I've said, but perhaps the best way to understand the actual uh, meaning of these words would be to provide an example, which also will uh, explain why uh, this discussion is relevant to what we talked about before in the previous slides, about phonons, crystals, and all these things. Now let us look uh, at a crystal uh, structure once again. So uh, we have here a periodic arrangement of atoms. But nobody puts this crystal structure by hand, right? So if we have a piece of uh, some solid, solid material, let's say a piece of copper, so nobody builds it by hand, like atom by atom. We don't, uh, we don't have to do it. So the nature does it itself. So these structures, they form spontaneously. And there is some wave function, if you want psi naught, 
which describe uh, described well very complicated wave functions which describes this atom. So how uh, do these atoms uh, form uh, in such a pattern? So uh, they, uh, you know, this psi naught is a solution to a certain Hamiltonian that describes those atoms. And uh, this uh, Hamiltonian, it has, uh, well, kinetic energy of all the particles involved in the problem, all these atoms, uh, plus uh, an energy uh, describing uh, its uh, interactions. And very importantly here, the interaction uh, well, it depends only on the distance between uh, the atoms. So here N and M, they label the various atoms. Now, if you look at this Hamiltonian, so you, you see that if we translate the whole thing, if we, let's say, change R uh, to R plus uh, some uh, constant distance, let's call it, let me call it D, then the Hamiltonian is not going to change, since we have here only the distance between uh, uh, particles, which is the position of uh, nth particle minus the position of mth particle, if we translate both of them by the same distance, the, uh, the distance between them is not going to change, right? So, so therefore, in other words, what, what I'm saying here is that here uh, the Hamiltonian is invariant under translations in uh, real space by an arbitrary, uh, it's very important, by an arbitrary distance. So, but if you look at the uh, crystalline arrangement here, so it is no longer invariant under an arbitrary translation. So if I move my particles, uh, let's say, by a fraction of this lattice constant, I'm not going to reproduce the crystal. So the crystal is still symmetric, but it's, uh, it has a symmetry which is sort of lower. It, it has only discrete symmetry, while the original symmetry of the problem was a continuum symmetry. And that's a crucial difference. And therefore here we have uh, broken, spontaneously broken, if you want, uh, three uh, continuum symmetries in the x, y, and z directions, and therefore there must exist uh, three modes, or three uh, or threefold degenerate mode, or well, at least uh, three uh, low energy modes in this state. And these modes are exactly the phonons that we're going to find. Of course, the, in our solution, as we will, we will, we will see them automatically, uh, uh, and they're not going to be related to a, a spontaneous symmetry breaking itself, but uh, it's very interesting, uh, this connection is very interesting because you can sort of uh, predict the existence of uh, such low energy modes just by uh, uh, the fact that cert certain types of structures form uh, out of symmetric systems. So um, in the rest of the uh, lectures uh, today, I'm not going to be uh, alluding to this Goldstone theorem. So this was just a remark for those of you who are interested in advanced uh, understanding or advanced subjects. But I just wanted to make this remark because I find it uh, quite illuminating because you can see the, the appearance of this very powerful, the application of this very powerful theorem in a very simple example.